Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Wayner After, and I'm Hi. the director. Hi, Rose. Here we are. Yay, I'm so glad that this worked. Um, okay, I'm going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Wayner After, and I'm the director of the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, um, which is our state agency that enforces our state's civil rights laws and is charged with eliminating discrimination in the state of New Jersey. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Rose Rojas, um, a senior at Lakewood High School. Rose is an incredible student leader, and she has joined me tonight to discuss a report that we issued in October, an anti-bias vision for the next generation. The report specifically discusses how children learn bias, racism, and prejudice from a very young age in our society, including in school, um, and how New Jersey has attempted to address this issue in the past. It then makes 27 recommendations for how New Jersey should do things differently in the future, including discussing bias, stereotyping, and prejudice as an integral part of the K-12 through curriculum, and including anti-bias training for all teachers. Rose, I am so grateful for all of your work in Lakewood, and I'm so grateful to have you here to discuss this incredibly important topic. So just first, can you start us off by just taking a few minutes to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rosalind Rojas, but everyone really calls me Rose. I'm sure most of you know me like that. Um, so I am 17 years old. I am a senior at Lakewood High School. I am the president of the student ambassador organization that we have there. Um, there we do some sort of like, you know, community work and, and stuff in schools and, and try to just really engage the community and engage the youth to um, get involved in the community and just get involved in the issues that matter most to them. Um, I am a student advocate for student equity and equality in terms of uh, private versus public education in our school district. And I have been advocating for these issues since I was about 13 years old back in eighth grade. Um, so I have been very passionate about these issues um, for a while now. And I'm passionate about change, about justice. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be part of this conversation with you, Rachel, and with the Division of Civil Rights. So I'm looking forward to this and all the initiatives that we can put together. Thank you so much, Rose. We are so grateful to have you and we are so inspired by everything that you have accomplished in your first 17 years. We cannot wait to see what you will accomplish <laughs> going forward. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in um, with um, trying to just get your views on the issues raised in the report. So the first thing that I want to ask is this summer brought a reckoning a long overdue reckoning with racial injustice, with many students using their voice on Instagram to share their experiences with racism and other forms of bias or prejudice at school. Um, specifically, Black at Pages have brought together stories of current and former students to show that racism and discrimination based on gender or religion or sex or sexual orientation or gender identity or expression or disability span states and they span generations. This, has, this is a, an ongoing problem in the United States and in New Jersey. So as students use social media to attempt to hold classmates and their schools accountable, does this give you hope that we are moving in the right direction? And do you feel like this is an important moment? Oh yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, the social media movements that occurred that we saw this past summer and even long before that are extremely crucial. Um, I think especially, you know, being in this global pandemic and everyone being stuck at home on quarantine, it kind of in a way forced everyone onto that social media aspect of learning and taking a different approach. Um, I think it taught us a lot about humanity and compassion in terms of just trying to understand the way that people live and the things that people experience outside of just where it affects us. Um, so in that case, I do think that social media was extremely impactful. And in fact, it was one of the main platforms that a lot of these movements used to to spread their message and, and um, get their movements across. So I do think that it's extremely important, especially moving forward. Um, the younger generation is very dependent on technology. So I do think that social media is a great platform to kind of not only spread a message, but to educate people, to allow people to learn and, and see things in a different way. 
I'm glad to hear um, this positive account of the possibilities on right. social media because we all know that hate and prejudice can themselves spread on social media. So I'm Absolutely. glad to hear that you think that social media can also be used for good in this area. Do you think that since the summer we have reached um, a point where people are recognizing other people as human beings and recognizing our mutual humanity more and doing less persistent othering of trying to see people as different based on their race or their religion and trying to pretend that those differences matter fundamentally when instead we all, um, I think, believe that fundamentally we're all human beings who are um, working towards the same goals, um, trying our best. And um, so do you think that that has made a difference over the past months? Oh, yeah, I do. Absolutely. I think um, some people call me an unrealistic optimist, but I do believe in, in humanity and in compassion. And I think um, as traumatizing and as terrible as it was to see everything with all the injustice happening over the summer, I think, like I said, it taught us a lot about humanity, you know, what it is to, to be Black in America or to be Hispanic in America and what those things mean for other people. And for those of us who don't experience those same uh, prejudices and discriminations that others do, it taught us a lot about what it means to just learn, to just step outside these issues where they affect you and, and try to step in someone else's shoes and see how it affects them. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all human beings, you know, we, we're all flesh, skin, bones, and we all come from the same, from the same place, you know, you know what I mean? We can have different backgrounds and, and religions and cultures, but we're all human beings and we're all people. And I think that uh, the social media movements that were occurring have allowed us to kind of see that in a different light, which I think is really impactful. So we completely agree that um, allowing people to talk about racism and bias and prejudice is incredibly important because um, this is not something that we will ever be able to conquer if we can't even right. honestly discuss it and honestly acknowledge um, what a huge impact it has on all of our lives. And so one of the most critical recommendations of the report is that all K through 12 schools should include anti-bias education for students as part of the curriculum and anti-bias and unconscious bias training for teachers and staff. So how essential do you think it is to get students to feel comfortable talking about bias or racism or prejudice in school? Oh, I think that's extremely important. And I, I think it's very long overdue. You know what I mean? I think that um, these issues are so impactful and so important. And schools have a responsibility to educate us. Schools have a responsibility to educate us not only in the regular subjects like math and English and science, but in the real world. Because especially, you know, at the high school level, you're preparing students to go into the real world. And a lot of the real world has that prejudice and that discrimination and bias. As much as a lot of us try to ignore it, it's there. And I think that the schools who don't try to educate our, our children about this and don't enforce the, the importance of voting or social justice or activism are essentially failing our students. I think they do have that, that very important responsibility to educate students in a well-rounded way outside of just the textbooks and the curriculums and the going through the motions of every day and in a way that you can engage students and, and you can allow them to interact with the lesson that will prepare them to be, you know, functional and productive members of society. I think that's the moral responsibility of a school at any level. And I do think that, that uh, these movements are very long overdue. Thank you. That brings to mind, um, during we held listening sessions across the state uh, before we prepared the report. And during those listening sessions, we heard um, a quote from a student who had been participating in a class with Facing History and Ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that she was also a senior in high school. And as part of the class, she learned about anti-Black racism and the history of anti-Black racism in the United States and also about the Holocaust. And she ended up saying, I've had 13 math classes, 20 English classes, six or seven science classes, art, phys ed, Spanish, but in all the time that I've been in school, I've only had one class about being more human. So what is your response to that? Oh man, I completely agree with her. I mean, I've been in school for 12 years and I wish I could say that I had a class that taught me you know, how to be human, how to have compassion for other people, how to love yourself, how to love each other. And I think, I think schools do have that responsibility to teach kids about that because 
not only are you supposed to educate them in the in the typical subjects and in typical curriculums, you're supposed to prepare them for the real world. And what kind of educational system would we, would we be putting out there if we didn't also inform them about social justice and about bias and discrimination and the things that are actually happening out there? These things happen in the workplace. They happen in every system that we see in America. And I think it's extremely important that we have more classes like that one. And it's really a shame that this, this young woman, uh, as you mentioned, only had one class that ever really taught her how to be human. And, and I, I do feel that way as well. And I know that so many other students across the nation can attest to that as well. And I do think that, that those uh, classes and courses are, are definitely needed. Dr. King in particular spoke about radical empathy, the idea of trying to understand enough about another person that you truly um, understand their perspective and you feel their pain. Right. Um, is that something that you think is taught in schools or that needs to be taught in schools? I, I do think that it needs to be taught and I don't think it's taught enough. I think um, a lot of students kind of just feel like they're going through the motions in school. And I think, especially with this whole transition to virtual learning, I believe that, that school stopped being so much about learning and engaging in the lesson, but more about passing and just getting a good grade. And I think that's where we're kind of losing so much of this younger generation, so much of my generation and my peers. And I know I can speak on that as well. I think we need to teach kids how to have empathy and how to have compassion because we're putting them out there after they graduate into the real world without having these core values. And they know how to do math and, and how to write a proper thesis statement, but who's teaching them how to be human? Who's teaching them how to have an engageful conversation with the police if they ever uh, come into contact with them? You know what I mean? Who is teaching them how to, how to de-escalate and escalate these situations? Who's teaching them how to be a human? You know what I mean? I think that's so important. And the, the educational systems that we see in America should definitely uh, have a, a greater focus on that. What responsibility, if any, do you think that schools have to resolve issues of racism, bias, prejudice, or bullying that happen between students in school? I think they have the greatest responsibility out of all of them that exist, um, not only to educate students, like I said, outside of the subjects of math and English, science, and all the typical curriculum stuff, but also, you know, how to be a human, how to have that compassion. But I also think that schools need to have the responsibility to equip our teachers with the materials to teach our students because teachers and educators play a massive role in a student's upbringing and in a student's growth and the way that they that way that they become an adult in the future so i think that a school has a responsibility to hire and train teachers that can teach a student about empathy and can and can really engage a student in the lesson and create an environment where they can feel safe talking about racism and bias and prejudice i think those things are extremely crucial. So I do think that school has a responsibility, not only to the student, but also to, to the teachers to equip them properly. In terms of responding to a particular incident of racism or um, harassment, bias-based harassment, what do you think the school's responsibility should be in that type of response? Should the school be responsible just for punishing the offending students, for helping the student who was hurt to heal, to seek justice for the wrong that was committed, for something else? What do you think a school's responsibility there should be? I think the school has a responsibility not only to resolve that issue, more than just on the surface, because I know that, you know, when we witness everything, all the injustice happening, a lot of people use the analogy of putting a Band-Aid over a gunshot wound. And I think a school's responsibility is so much deeper than that. It's deeper than just the Band-Aid and it's deeper than just the wound. It's about finding the root causes of these issues. And I think our schools have a responsibility, schools all over America, to dig so much deeper you have to dig deeper and you have to find the root causes of, of what is causing a student to feel so inferior to another student or feel so superior to another student where we have these cases of racism and bias and prejudice. You have to, you have to dig deeper and talk about, you have to look into a student's culture, into where a student comes from, what's going on in that student's personal life. How can, how can we help them? How can we engage with our community and try to understand a different culture outside of just where it affects us? So I do think there's so much work. It's, it's so many levels that you really have to break down and, and take apart to understand why these issues happen and how we can prevent them again in the future. In terms of making students feel safe enough in school to actually be able to take part in that kind of 
honest and raw conversation. Um, what do you think that student that schools need to do there? And then have you also seen any success? I know a lot of schools have responded to um, the incidents over the summer and the allegations of race based discrimination in their own schools with things like climate surveys to try to gauge how students are feeling listening sessions where students can come and really share honest feedback. How do we make students feel comfortable enough in those situations? situations to be able to share honest feedback? That's a good question. I think um, part of that question has to do has to deal with how do we engage the youth, you know, not only in school, but outside of school. And the first thing that comes to mind there, I would say clubs and extracurricular activities and sports. But you also have to take into account that not every student can fit those extracurricular activities in their lives. But what they what they're in school every day, they're in class every day. So that's where we have to engage these important issues and, and throw in these little these moments of, of teaching and these moments of, of understanding and compassion and empathy in the classes where they sit every day. So that we don't have students just sitting in desks and falling asleep and not engaged in a lesson. But we're talking about issues that readily affect them. We're talking about issues that have impacted them, that will impact them, that will impact their brothers and their sisters and their families and their friends. So that's where these issues become the most important where we take those moments and harness these moments and use them for, for teaching valuable lessons to them. So I think, like I said, the school has the responsibility to engage students in the issues that will affect them, the, the things that go on in their community and in their society. I think students, I, I think schools should enforce voting, especially, you know, we had this past election and, and my school personally, I don't think I heard uh, any teacher, any administrator really enforce voting and why it's so important. I think these are the things that, that need to be taught to us. And I think the school has that responsibility to educate us in every way, shape, and form. Have you seen throughout your experience in school or in after school activities or in the student ambassador group, have you seen teachers or administrators use these teachable moments to talk about racial injustice or to talk about so many of the injustices that have really become that should have been part of our national conversation for hundreds of years, but kind of really come to the surface over the past year? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there, there were some, some teachers that did stand out and, and use those teachable moments. I know when everything happened um, with the, the, everything with the storming of the White House and whatnot, I know a lot of teachers, just, some teachers just kind of shut everything down, shut the curriculum, close the textbooks and kind of play the live moment to really experience that historical that historical moment for the students, because we are living through history. I mean, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and, and this, this, is, this is moments that are going to be in the textbook soon. So um, I do think that there were some teachers, and there are some, some outstanding individuals, especially in Lakewood, that um, do do their part to educate students in more than just the textbooks, more than just the curriculum, and they kind of step outside to where that impacts us in the real world. And did you hear any connections made for teachers that were discussing the insurrection in Washington? Did you insurrection in Washington? Did you hear any connections made with uh, the white supremacist beliefs that had people bringing a noose and gallows, Confederate flags, shirts yeah. that said six million was not enough, or Camp Auschwitz? Did you hear those types of conversations in school as well? I did. I did hear uh, some of those conversations. Maybe um, not so much with most of the teachers, because I know politics is a little bit of a touchy subject and a lot of people try to avoid it. But um, there are, like I said, some outstanding individuals in our school community and in our community overall that are really put emphasis on these issues and make those connections to you know, the past, the present, and the future. Thank you. One of the things that we talked about um, when we met um, earlier today was the um, Nelson Mandela quote, how he was right when he wrote in his autobiography, A Long Walk to Freedom, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Absolutely. I just wanted you to be able to comment on that because I know that that um, is an important value in your life you mentioned. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, when we talk about racism, when we talk about bias and discrimination and everything, those things are learned. You know, nobody is born racist. Nobody is born um, prejudice and, and having these hateful views, those things are, are enforced on them. Those things are instilled in them since, since a young age, but nobody is born like that. And those things are all learned. And I believe the same way that they're learned, they can be unlearned. And um, there's a quote, something along the lines of, uh, love is easier to, to, to learn than hate. 
And I think that that's so important. I think you can really teach kids. You can teach students. You can teach adults. You can teach anyone how to love someone. You can teach some, them how to have compassion. And I think it starts in the youth. I think it starts in elementary school levels. You know, the first exposure that students have to, to other people, to socialization and, and to the real world. I think if we if we do the work to equip our teachers with child psychology training and and things along those lines, we can teach students. We can set those foundations for anti-bias and anti-racism and anti-discrimination, so that they have those those values and those morals growing into adulthood and their adolescence. One of the things that we pointed out in the report is that, um, especially for young children, they can learn bias and prejudice and racism, not only from people outwardly expressing biased views, um, but also just from being part of our society. And so, for example, in school, uh, they can learn those messages from whose history and whose history is valued in the curriculum versus whose it is not, or whose behavior is policed in the classroom versus whose is not, um, or whose achievement is expected versus whose is not. And so what experience, if any, have you had with um, how students are able to learn almost from the air that we breathe and the water that we drink uh, messages of bias from a very young age? Well, I do think that um, the exposure that we see now, especially with the generation that I'm growing up in, comes from the media. And although some, I, I, I wish more of that would come from schools and I wish that schools would take a little bit more responsibility, especially all over the nation to educate them that way. But I do think that a lot of the knowledge and the education that students and, and young people around the world have now comes from social media, whether that's used for a positive way or a negative way. I think that um, it, allows to, it allows people to learn and to educate themselves and kind of to see things that are happening around the world things that are happening just outside of Lakewood or outside of, of what you know, what's familiar to you. There's so many things around you that are happening that you may have gone on, that may have gone unheard of. So I do think uh, that social media plays a massive role in that, whether it's used for positive or negative. Thank you. Have you seen examples of students standing up against bias and prejudice in a way that you found to be inspiring, either in school or out of school? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I know in our school we do have some some clubs and some initiatives that that do um, make it their mission to stand up against hate and bias and discrimination. And especially over the summer when all of these protests were happening around the world, um, there were some that I personally attended over the summer as well that we had here in Lakewood. Um, you just students stepping out of their comfort zones and even in the middle of a global pandemic, that should you know show you how important it was to us. And um, you know Lakewood is is not is not unfamiliar with protests. We've been protesting and, and fighting the good fight with, with all of these different issues of adversity for a very long time. And one thing I can say about my community is that when there's adversity, when there's bias, when there's discrimination, when there's prejudice, we stand up and we come together and we really protest and, and we fight for, for what we believe in. So um, definitely we had a couple protests in the summer, uh, movements taken using the platform of social media, uh, some in schools, some great teachers that were able to really uh, uh, force the, the movements on students and, and engage them like that. I think um, that those those that was really good for us too. I'm I'm so glad to hear that. And I saw reporting over the summer about communities coming together at protests. People who might have otherwise not encountered each other as part of their daily lives really coming together to stand up and to say um, enough is enough, and this is not something that we are going to stand for. Um, we are currently running until February fifteenth a campaign where students can share artwork or a hashtag or a slogan or a video that expresses how they personally stand up to hate. Um, have you heard anything? What can? What do you want to say about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we both know Colin and how crazy he is about this whole Stand Up Against Hate campaign. And um, this initiative, I think it's great. And um, I know we've been trying to, to work with the administration at my school to kind of get this, get the, the ball moving there as well. Um, but this campaign, I think it's great, especially using the art department and allowing students to express their views about hate and prejudice and bias uh, in our community through their artwork. And I think that that personalization is, uh, is, allowing, is allowing a lot of students to express themselves about the way that not only the, these issues are affecting the world around them, but how they're affecting them personally. And it, it allows students to take a stance in their own way. 
you know, protesting doesn't look the same for everyone. Some people uh, like to use the social media. Some people like to really go out in the streets and protest. And other, there's more subtle ways to protest than stand for something you believe in. Um, I 100% agree. And for um, young people, especially, sometimes you can convey something in artwork that you might not feel comfortable saying or that you might not even be able to find the words to say. I was recently reading um, about a person who was 13 years old um, when he was at Auschwitz during the Holocaust and he drew his experience after the Holocaust because he was unable to articulate and to be able to verbally share with people and they're actually publishing a book of his I think it's 80 drawings um, within the coming months so for anyone who is interested in submitting either artwork, it can be visual artwork, it can be a video, it can be a slogan or a hashtag, um, please go to www.njcivilrights.gov and right on the front of our homepage, there is a link to the Youth Bias Task Force student competition. You can submit any artwork until February 15th, so in 11 days. Um, and it can be something that you made in the past, it can be something that you are making just for this. There are also various forms that um, younger students will have to get their parents to sign. Um, so please go to www.njcivilrights.gov to find out more about how to participate in the competition. And student winners will be announced uh, during April and will be able to participate in a live event where they will be honored and celebrated for their work. Um, so thank you to everyone who has participated with us live. Huge thank you to Rose. I saw a number of the comments saying that they were inspired about the possibilities for the future because of people like Rose and I 100% share that. Uh, talking to Rose has given me renewed confidence in what we are able to achieve as a country and as a state um, if we uh, come together. And so Rose, I just wanted to give you the opportunity for any closing remarks. And again, thank you so much for participating with me tonight. Absolutely, thank you so much, Rachel. And if I had to leave everyone with one thing, I would say just just be be more compassionate, you know, be human and not everything, not not everything has to be so negative. Not everything has to be so, so strict. Sometimes sometimes we can just be human. Sometimes we can just see past a badge and a gun on someone's hip or or a, a suit and tie. Sometimes we can just be human and just try to understand each other from a different perspective. Just try to step out of just what's familiar to us and, and into someone else's world to see how they live and, and to see the kind of things that they experience on the daily so that we can just be part of something greater than all of us and hopefully leave our legacy to inspire those that come after us. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, I think if any, if all of us were to take one message from this conversation um, as Rose's message of needing to step out of our comfort zones and really trying to um, feel another person's pain and understand where they come from. Um, that would be incredible. And so again, thank you, Rose, for participating. Thank you to everyone who submits, uh, again, www.njcivilrights.gov to submit artwork or hashtags or videos. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you. Bye, everyone.